Welcome to Hope on Fire, relevant talk radio for young adults. Whether you're 25 or 45, there's bound to be a discussion that you care about. Our mission is to share practical ways to find God in your everyday life. And now today's host, Chris Lang. The World Health Organization recently reported that there are now more overweight people in the world than there are malnourished, and that this may be the first generation in history where children die before their parents do due to lifestyle-related diseases. So whose problem is it anyway? Many parents seek help for their overweight kids, but too often they step back and rely on the experts. But unless parents become lifestyle quarterbacks for their kids, directing healthy changes for their family, a child will never reach and maintain a healthy weight. Hello, I'm Chris Lang, and today's topic is lifestyle quarterbacks. Our guests will share stories from the front lines and provide helpful information and tips that parents or anyone can use at home right now. I want to introduce the special people in the studio with me today. Um, first, Sherry Flint uh, is with us here. She's a, a repeat uh, visitor. Welcome back, Sherry. Thank you. Sherry is manager of the Center for Nutritional Excellence at Florida Hospital in Orlando. She's also co-author of Supersized Kids, and we're really excited that you're Thank here you. today to talk about your Thanks. book and your experience there um, in healthcare. Also with us is uh, Dr. Saska Sukra, a family practice physician. She's working for Centricare Walk-In Clinics here in Central Florida. Welcome, Saska. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Thank you. And finally, last but not least, my brother Rob, who has been in youth work as a youth pastor for about 20 years now, Rob. Have mercy. Oh, my. <laughs> Time flies yes. when you're having fun. Uh, Rob is uh, presently youth director for the Georgia Cumberland Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Welcome, Rob. Thanks. Good to be here. Great to have you on the show today. Well, uh, you know, this, uh, this topic is, uh, is so timely, I think, for our, our, our listeners today. Uh, recently, I saw a, a program uh, called Shaq's Big Challenge, which featured six obese kids who get to work with Shaquille O'Neal to lose weight and they learn healthy lifestyle habits. And I, I thought as I saw portions of that series, that it, along with, with research and studies that have been done, that we're clearly in a world, world, worldwide, if I can spit that word out, crisis, aren't we? <laughs> I mean, how so did true. we get here? I mean, that's really the, what the shocking reality is. How did, you know, the question is, how did we get here? Well, I think there's several things that we need to look at. It would be easy to blame it on genetics that we have nothing to do with it and there's nothing that can be done. But the truth is when you look at the last 20 years, our society, our environment has changed so much and it really hasn't changed for the better as far as our health is concerned. And there's so many things that make our life easier and therefore we become more sedentary, but we're not cutting back on our eating in relationship to that. So I think our environment plays a big role in this whole epidemic of obesity. That's great, Sherry. Saska, what are your thoughts? Well, I think also there's a breakdown in the families, as we can tell, with the increased divorce rate, and that affects our family dynamics, time to spend together as a family. Um, you know, that affects how many times, you know, the people can spend with their children and be able to do things that are healthy, even just dinner together. That has dramatically decreased, and I think that definitely has an effect on the increasing rates of obesity that we see today. You were sharing, uh, when we were planning for this program, uh, a, quite a graphic example when you were grocery shopping <laughs> recently. Yeah, actually, I was at Publix. I hope this isn't the advertisement for Publix, <laughs> but um, and in front of me at the grocery checkout, there was a, a quite obese lady, and she was on one of those motorized um, scooters, as they call them, and her daughter was with her. Daughter was also overweight, not quite as much as mom, and they had loads. They had uh, four boxes of donuts, like those huge trays of donuts, some other things, and her daughter, she was passing on to her daughter, um, chocolate like snickers and things like that from the little aisle where you check out as well and so i just thought it was such a um clear example of how your family influences your choices that you're going to make for food and eating well because here it was mom is in this you know in this capacity that she can't even walk anymore as the average person to do grocery shopping and you know so it definitely outlined how 
the family has a big role in the choices our kids make. Rob, when we were kids, you used to wear some corduroys named Husky, didn't you? Okay, throw that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Husky was the word. Sears and Roebuck made those, and they were they were really the thing to wear for me. Um, but you know, I over the and you mentioned it, twenty years, two decades. I've been working with young people, and you know, there has been a noticeable inflation, if you will, in their bodies over this course of time. Um, my privilege to work at a youth camp. You know, we have line calls three times a day, and, you know, you have 240 or 50 kids lined out there, and you just kind of survey the crowd, and, and you look them over. And, and, you know, there's a lot of kids that are struggling with this problem. It's, it's a huge problem for our society. Um, but more importantly, for them personally, individually, those each individual person, um, the culture that they're living in is different than the one that you and I grew up in. I still wore Huskies. <laughs> right, but it's changed. Right. It, it's it's beyond husky. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's mm -hmm. the word beyond husky <laughs> now. Yeah, big boned, I suppose, is a term now. Now, Sherry, you you do a, a lot. Both you and Saska in your practice do a lot of health education. Mm -hmm. What are some of the dynamics that you see when you have the parent and the child there in the room with you? Uh, children look up to their parents as role models. Correct. What are the dynamics you're seeing in that environment? Well, what I tend to see is the parent kind of removing themselves from the situation and expecting me to interact only with the child. And they'll, you know, the child will look to them when I ask a question, and the parent will typically say, well, she's not talking to me. You need to answer the questions. If the child's five or six, that, that's a definite disadvantage. You know, if the child's 18 or 19, well, they can go to the store and buy food. Um, you know, they can make more decisions for themselves. But a lot of times the parents do tend to just sit back. Or another dynamic I see happening is they'll ask me to explain to the overweight child why they can't eat certain foods, but the normal weight sibling can. And of course, the first thing I think is, well, you need to explain that to me because that's not how it should work. The entire family has to pull together, make the same healthy choices, whether it's nutrition, whether it's activity. Um, we'll talk more about TV time, those kinds of things. Right. But it needs to be done as a family coming together to support this child. That's the only way this whole problem can be addressed and conquered. Yeah, Rob, go ahead. I was just going to say I um, I agree wholeheartedly with that. I, I to me, I uh, two years ago when I'm standing at line call and I, I just start having this conviction, you know, what are we doing to help these kids? And the 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 numbers growing, and I started thinking, you know, they had this Biggest Loser program on TV, and mm -hmm. and, and that got a lot of publicity and and really show that people can make progress. They can consistently right. work at something mm -hmm. and, and achieve a, a life-changing experience. And, and um, I started talking with some of my staff, you know, what can we do to help them? And we started thinking creatively of things we could do within the camp culture uh, where we could make things cool right. as a staff. Right. And we could help them see another reality that they might not see somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and we worked on it and prayed about it, and but really didn't feel at peace doing it for the very reason that it really needs to be a family mm -hmm. event if it's going to truly truly have a long-term impact in the in, in the child's life. So um, we're not sure exactly how we're going to do it yet, but family fitness, camps, family involvement, um, anyway, we're dreaming right now, and this uh, information today is is really on my heart. That's, that's tremendous, Rob. One of the comments that came up as we were planning was the issue that uh, parents, because they're number one, uh, you know, oftentimes there may be a sense of guilt on the parent's part for not walking the walk. What are you seeing, Saska? I mean, it, it, are, do, you, do you think that's part of what's going on here? I think, I definitely think guilt plays a role. I think I've had different reactions from parents who really want to help their children um, lose weight. They just don't know how. They haven't, because they have themselves are overweight and they have been making poor choices all along, so they don't know how to do it themselves. Um, but as well, you may find some parents who can be defensive about it, um, guilt, or just um, indifferent to the problem that they just don't see a major issue with it. It's something almost, when you ask them, so what are we doing about um, her weight? they kind of look a little surprised that I've 
approach them with that topic. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it's definite part of educating if you're in a, um, a role to educate the public. This is a problem, but some there's so many things that can be done. So the, the 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 parent is one of the components, but I've heard I've heard the discussion about how schools can actually start healthy education to the children, who then take that home and kind of cross pollinate um, the family unit with right. with good information. Right. Before we go to the break, I know there's probably some parents listening, uh, and they probably have a question: How much does genetics play into uh, the problem of obesity in the world today? Uh, well, 99% 99, 99 of all cases of obesity that we see in America are, are multifactorial. Sorry, Rob, I had to use that word before you. I love um, that word. I love it. 99% of all cases of, of obesity are multifactorial, meaning there's genetics involved, but the researchers have not been able to isolate that particular gene. And it's also complex environmental in things that are responsible for that. There's less than 1% of very rare cases um, that obesity is called by a single gene mutation. But for the majority of us, it's basically more lifestyle related. Well, then, then you can look at that two different ways, can't you? You can look at that as, wow, I'm at ground zero. I've got a long way to go. But I heard, Rob, you said the other day, well, there's hope, right? Absolutely. If 90% yes. is lifestyle choices, um, that's, a, that's a tremendous... Uh, at least a uh, ray of light mm -hmm. for families. Isn't it, it essentially means that, that what we're dealing with and what we need to somehow collectively work together on is a culture change. And, and if the culture can change in these kids' lives, then they have a chance to have a healthy, uh, productive, uh, blessed life as opposed to carrying all the baggage, uh, no pun intended, extra right, baggage right. all the way through their life yeah. and not being able to do the things that their heart really wants to be able to do, but they are not capable. Uh, we're going to talk in the in the second half of the program uh, about some essential elements in your book, Supersized Kids, Sherry. Give us a little background on this book and uh, the feedback that you're getting. Well, basically what the book does is look at the research and, you know, what really is going on with kids and their weight and really shows parents that, yes, this is something we need to be concerned about, but then it, it moves on to there is hope. I mean, when you look at it at first glance, it may seem hopeless, but there is hope because it is mostly lifestyle related. And so that means if you start changing certain behaviors, you can impact that. And when families read the book, the feedback I get is, wow, I can do this. There are things I can do that will make a difference. That's awesome. Well, we're looking forward to hearing more about that book. Uh, we hope you all will stay with us. You're listening to Hope on Fire, relevant talk radio for young adults. Welcome back to Hope on Fire, relevant talk radio for young adults. I'm here with uh, my guests in the studio uh, today, uh, Sherry Flint, Saska Sukra, and Rob Lang. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you. We're talking today about lifestyle quarterbacks. And for those of you not familiar with American football, uh, that's the guy who coordinates his team out there and passes the ball or throws it. And he's basically the general or the captain of his team. And that's what we're talking about today, about getting parents involved in, uh, in this, ep this worldwide epidemic. See, I said at that time, worldwide epidemic <laughs> that, uh, that we're facing, uh, not just in the United States, but, but literally even in developing co countries mm -hmm. overseas. So I um, <clears throat> wanted to just jump right into these uh, essential uh, areas in your book, Sherry. The first one being uh, getting adequate rest. Is there a connection between the amount of sleep a child gets and his or her weight? There definitely is. There are several large studies. One was done in Germany on about 7,000 kids, one in Japan on 8,000, and they found a direct relationship between the amount of time a child sleeps each night and what their weight was. The less sleep a child gets, the more likely they are to be overweight. And most parents are surprised to learn the recommendation is 9 to 10 hours a night through the teen years. Um, I dare say most American children aren't getting anywhere near that amount for various reasons. But that's one issue that parents can look at and maybe make just some small changes that could help the health of their child. 
What, what are some things that impact the quality of a child's sleep, uh, Saska, and some of the steps families can take to improve the sleep patterns of their kids? I think um, definitely their level of activity. People who are sedentary have problems sleeping, um, as well as TV is one of the biggest influences. And we were talking about this before. The TV is actually a stimulus, and so it actually stimulates the brain. And so children who are of more... Um, focused on that right before they go to bed they have a harder time getting to bed mm -hmm. so i think a lot of carbonated drinks you know sugary foods and so forth also diet plays a role into how much how well a child is going to sleep at night okay any uh, did you have another and caffeine or? along with the the sugary drinks caffeine definitely can make a difference because it stays in our system for quite a while and if a child is drinking you know, a super latte from the corner coffee shop about six o'clock at night, you know, at three in the morning, they still have a significant mm -hmm. amount of caffeine that could disrupt their sleep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, one of the things that um, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, that uh, th that's, that's part of our culture uh, as Christians is keeping, keeping the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. And Rob, as a pastor and as a family man, as, as a father uh, and a husband, what are what's the impact and the benefit you, that you see of, of a Sabbath rest for your family and your kids? Well, I really think it's part of the owner's manual, you know, uh, the, the creator God who put it all together and set it in motion. Uh, his crowning point was to set aside time. And uh, and that time was to benefit and bless. And uh, indeed, uh, it's um, it's something that that allows a person to have a chance to put things in balance in their lives. Uh, we were talking earlier, and, you know, I think the Sabbath does, you know, how does the Sabbath relate to uh, overweight or losing weight or what have you? Right. How do, how do, what's the relationship? Well, you know, I believe that, um, that the Sabbath is to keep a balance. And if you're sitting at a desk all week and that's what you're doing, then God has given you this piece of time to do something different and have a different balance point. Maybe sure. it's time to go for a really good hike with your family in nature and really burn some calories. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're digging ditches all week, you know, probably you don't need that uh, five, eight mile hike, right. you know, but right. maybe you need to actually sleep. But <laughs> so the, I, I see that the Sabbath being God's formula uh, to give people a chance in a hectic, stressed, paced life to find that balance point. And, and find some equilibrium. That's great, Rob. W what are some of the scientific benefits of, uh, the, we talked about the stress factor earlier, how the Sabbath can right. benefit reduced mm -hmm. yeah. stress. Because cortisol. cortisol, right. Um, we have been seeing research in adults and even now in children that when they're stressed, there's certain chemicals in their body that tend to increase that could lead to um, gaining more weight. It also changes your eating habits. I mean, we all know when we're stressed, we tend to reach mm -hmm. for things that aren't as healthy, the caffeine, the chocolate, the, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But definitely, I think getting that balance, as Rob said, is so important. All the time I hear from families, well, our lives are so hectic, we just don't have time to sit down and eat together. So the mm -hmm. drive through is the option. Mm -hmm. Again, that Sabbath rest allows you to bring that balance back refocus. and right refocus and really look at what's important and spend that time together and start connecting so the children and the parents then come together as a family and can work on this problem together. I, th I think that's a tremendous segue into this next section, which is reduced exposure to television, computers, and video games. Right. <laughs> Let's talk about that for a minute. Well, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that children watch no more than two hours of TV per day. There's actually studies that show that kids who watched four hours of TV as compared to the children that watched two hours or less had a significantly increased um, body mass index, meaning their weight was a lot higher than the ones who watched less TV. So there's a definite link, I think, to that. And also there is research that shows when we're watching TV, it changes our brain chemistry, so our metabolism drops up to 16%, and basically it's the same as if we were asleep. My. <laughs> so sitting and reading a book burns more calories than sitting and watching TV. I've even heard the brain waves go to basically flatline. Yes. Which yeah. is mm -hmm. kind of scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, what's the, so the recommendation for, for a more healthy level of exposure um, 
what, no more two than two hours, hours no a day? No more than two hours for and, children. And that includes video and computer time. Right. Although homework that's done on computers, I always tell families that's that's different because, I mean, they didn't even have computers when I was in grade <laughs> school. But that that is a big part of, of homework for kids today. But leisure time, definitely two hours. Mm -hmm. Now, we know there's, there's a movement among gaming uh, uh, companies to develop healthy kinds of interaction because we know that video games aren't going to go away. It's part of the fabric of young society, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So what are you seeing out there as far as the, the potential in that area for young people to, to be active in that way? Well, I think there's definitely, mm -hmm. it's, that's what they're into, so we might as well take advantage of it. If it gets them moving, like Dance Dance Revolution, mm -hmm. um, there's you know, some you have to hook up to a bike and the game won't play unless you're pedaling the bike. I mean, they have there's like Wii, the, which yeah, you swing Wii, about, right, yeah. things like that that's out. Yeah. So, so I heard somebody more. broke their television screen <laughs> yeah. when one yeah. of those bats. <laughs> right. so it can and be I dangerous. Yes. Yeah. And I've heard you can work up a sweat, so that's that's, that's good. Uh, well, let's talk about, since we're talking about health, uh, you know, daily activity, um, how active should a kid be? Every day. Yeah, very active. It, the recommendations at, what, right, at 60 minutes total mm -hmm. for the day. We never used to sit around and ask ourselves, how active should we be, Rob, did <laughs> oh, we? Oh, no. No, we didn't. But uh, I, for those that are listening, I can suggest that summer camp is a great place for them to be active. <laughs> That's right. That's uh, right. I mean, it's, it's yeah. nonstop, and it's good right. stuff. Um, and, and, and if a young person wants to be active, that's a good place to be. Yeah. That, you know, that's interesting because uh, all shapes and sizes and ages love to come to camp, mm -hmm. and it's hot in the summertime. And uh, it's a great weight management strategy if you could just <laughs> extend that a little longer. Right. Um, but uh, now getting off the couch, um, getting more active, this again comes back to the family leadership of the parents. Definitely. How do they do that? How do they do that? I think, you know, one of the biggest things that can help families is having more. There's been such a recent cut in physical activity in schools. And if they were to bring that back, that would really help. Um, the children to be more active, that they have daily physical education. Because uh, I find that a lot of the lower income bracket families, they have a harder time with that factor because they may end up having less access to, you know, a park that's safe or, you know, um, uh, the things that we may take for granted, like the gym or right. things like that. So sure. I find that if schools can increase that, and that's where uh, as people who are, um, and as, as healthcare providers, as people who are involved with children and so on, there needs to be more lobbying to keep that part of this, the, f the school system to keep educate because you know now it's it's an option for a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. They can do either music or physical education, and exactly. it shouldn't be the case. Well, we got a couple minutes left, and I wanted to spend uh, the, la the last time we have uh, on nutrition. Now, for those of you watching uh, or listening today, there, uh, Sherry did a series called Is Your Diet Killing You? A uh, two-part series that you'll want to go to our website and, uh, and check out hopeonfire.org, and there you can watch those two programs to get more details. But in the little time we have left, uh, let's touch base on, on fresh fruits and veggies. Um, everyone knows they don't get enough. How about fresh versus canned or frozen? Well, we're finding frozen, it has pretty much the same nu nutritional composition as fresh, and in some cases more because the food, the fruit, the vegetables harvested, it's frozen almost immediately, and so the nutrient composition is stable at that point, where with fresh, it's got to make its way to the store, it sits on the shelf, it has to make its way to your house, it may stay in the refrigerator a day or two, and it can be losing nutrition. So that makes it easier for parents when they realize it can be more economical using frozen, and it's more convenient because you don't have to worry about using it up right away before it spoils. Plus, plus fresh fr produce is pretty expensive too, isn't and it? And it can be, right. Yeah. Now, we want to talk about healthy <laughs> snacks for a minute, and I have, a, I, I have, a, I have a, I'm kind of still hungry and yeah. wouldn't mind having a cookie. And that's an example of but, what uh, not is so a healthy snack. I, Wait, uh, don't yeah, eat that cookie. Right, I, was, yes. I was actually considering yeah, engaging you, you in this. You do realize what you're doing, right? Let's, I, I'll make sure you're informed before you Can you, you give me it. an example of what this could mean yeah. to somebody? Well, just as an example. One every day. Yeah. With a cookie, every ounce is a, roughly 100 calories. So, and of course, this is a little bigger than a Chip Ahoy, but I'll use that example. A Chip Ahoy cookie is about 100 calories. If you eat one every day, in addition to your daily needs, you could gain about 10 pounds a week. 
that's just one little per tiny. week or per year per year i'm sorry did i say week <laughs> yeah okay i'm sorry per this year. is a hit but i have to cook it i was really wanting to get my point across there <laughs> i'm feeling it sherry yeah I'm well right. with that size you might gain if you ate one of those <laughs> yeah. maybe yeah. 10 pounds a week i also heard an illustration recently that if you drink a can of soda one a day on top of a normal diet, mm. that you will gain one pound per month. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think if people knew that, it's shocking. Yeah. Well, I want to thank wonderful. you all for being on the show today, Sherry and Saska and Rob. It's been a great to, mm -hmm. to do this thank together. You. Remember, the obesity problem is not about weight loss alone. It's about more physical activity, more sleep, and better eating. And don't forget that God wants your family to be in great physical health, too. In strengthening your physical health, you give him greater ability to connect with your mind, both, both spiritually and emotionally. So if you sometimes feel like eating that box of Twinkies with your kids or maybe all by yourself, stop, don't do it. You'll be glad you made a healthy choice one day at a time. God bless you. Thanks for watching. Hope on Fire is produced by Livestreams Media, a listener-supported ministry. To download a free copy of today's program or be a part of our social network, please visit our website at hopeonfire.org. You may also contact us by writing to Lifestreams Media, P.O. Box 608-513, Orlando, Florida 32860. Once again, that's Lifestreams Media, P.O. Box 608-513, Orlando, Florida 32860 or online at hopeonfire.org. Thank you so much for your letters and continued support. Until next time, may God set your hope on fire.